Just to introduce myself, my name's David Shevin, I'm the Manager and Director of GIK Acoustics Europe. Um, basically, for those who don't already know us, we formed in the USA about 15 years ago, and then formed in, in the UK, serving the whole of Europe and the Middle East, in, in just coming up to our 10th anniversary now. Basically, we're manufacturers and designers of acoustic treatment. We provide sort of off-the-shelf solutions, but we also provide um, free acoustic advice, education, that type of thing. And we basically, we work in all sorts of different environments, from home theatres like this one, uh, auditoriums, restaurants. Um, we do two-channel listening rooms. But where we came from originally, and what you know, everyone involved in the creation of the business is, is things like this, which is live rooms, um, and, and control rooms. This is uh, some work we do with the Abbey Road Institute in Abbey Road in London, for example. Basically, what we try to do is um, bring the pro, the pro audio approach to your home acoustics. Um, so we're really, you know, our, our expertise has always been in making really, really tight and very accurate sounding uh, studios. Um, but there's a couple of things I wanted to do at the beginning, and one of it is to do with you know, the sort of challenges we get when we try and take that and take that approach and then bring it into the hi-fi world. The first question we always talk about, really, is what is acoustics? You know, why is it that we're talking about treating um, a hi-fi room and you know, understanding? And basically, it's a science of um, getting the best sound out of your room. Traditionally, People have always looked at acoustics and what they've considered, they all talked about deadening sound, killing sound, diffusing it, that type of thing. And what we're really looking at these days is what I would like to call is the manipulation of sound. We know that physics exists, we know that there's a different aspects of how sound actually interacts with the environment that it enters. So what we're trying to do, and a lot of people see this as a bad thing, as interference, but what we're trying to do now these days, and there's lots of different technologies to approach this, what we're trying to do is, is basically make that sound and those interferences work for us in a positive way, rather than it being a, you know, a negative experience. So basically, you clear up that sound and it allows the systems and speakers to be heard exactly the way that they're designed. Because at the moment, um, every time you move a speaker into a different room, the physics of the room is going is to actually uh, affect it. So one of the other things I like to you know sort of talk about before we go um, go into sort of um, go is uh, one of the things I talk about today. I'm going to tell you about some guides and some general guidelines and rules about how to set up your room. All of these are guides. This is, you know, it's very easy for us sometimes in, you know, going in the studio world to say, yeah, we're going to set up a studio. We've got absolute freelance to put lots of panels in all different places, but people's reality isn't like that. So what we always got to look out for this, this is guides, this is a way to get started. These are ways and tips to make your room sound better, but you don't need to be able to match them all, you don't need to follow them all. A lot of people have a lot of restrictions. If you're really lucky to have an, enough to have your own listening room, it's great, but quite often it's a shared space. There's lots of different aspects, and we do take that into consideration. So when we're talking to people about acoustics, we're not saying we're going to be able to provide anybody with the perfect room. What we're going to say to everybody is we can make your room sound better. We still, um, unfortunately, we don't have any, I don't think we have any sound, do we? Still? No. So we haven't got any sound, so this part, <laughs> this part of it um, comes a, li a, um, a little bit that I can't demonstrate. But basically, what we tried to do, just just give you an idea, is we've got a, a demo room in our Atlanta office. Um, basically, it's got some um, PMCs, 228s in it, and we basically recorded a piece of music in an empty room. And when you heard that recording, which you can faintly hear in the background <laughs> behind me, um, the, um, what, what you'd hear is the vocals, are, there's a lot of echo on the vocals, the bass is very, very muddy, you can't really hear it. And then what we did is we recorded the same piece of music again, and what we'd done is we treated the room so exactly the same equipment, exactly the same piece of uh, you know, music to play. And the difference, if I could have done this example, is, uh, is the, the, the reverb from the vocals is all gone, so a lot clearer. But really importantly, what you can hear on this example really well normally is that the bass is a lot punchier. Because when we're looking at acoustics, it's not just sometimes, it's not just about 
different frequencies being louder or quieter. It's about the decay time. How long does each of those frequencies stay in the room? Because what you're looking for is you're looking, you know, you're looking for um, that bass to be really sharp. You want to hear the beginning and the end of it. When we're talking to people in studios, you imagine the creators of the music that's making this for at home. If they can't hear the start and the end of a frequency, they actually can't mix correctly. But ultimately, if you want to hear the music as it was made, you're, you're in the same situation. You need to be able to stop that, those frequencies ringing out in the room and making a mess of your sound. So how does it mostly work? There's a, couple of, there's, there's a few different ways of, uh, of acoustics, and we'll go through those in a minute. But the, the main part of the physics of the room, and this really applies to a lot of the low end, you can actually find out what, where your low end would actually come into this on a thing called the Skoda frequency um, scales, which is done all by room calculations. But basically, you hear a lot of talk about room modes. And basically, this is the way the sound interacts in the room. There's three main modes we're really interested in. The first of those is the axle modes. Everybody knows these. It's the height, it's the width, and it's the length of the room. And the way that each of the frequencies interact with this is the first one you'll get. And you'll find a lot of the problems are axle modes. The second type of mode you'll get is a tangential mode, as you can see on the top desk diagram. You'll know this one as well more than you think you do. Square rooms are a good example. Um, that's where you'll get a problem. So if you get a problem at 80 hertz and you've got a square room, you're going to have twice as many problems at 80 hertz. And that's why it makes it really difficult to treat square rooms. And we try and avoid them if we can. The third one is called an oblique mode. It's basically just the way the sound interacts with absolutely everything in the room. This is the hardest one for us to predict in, in any scenario. Because if you think we can calculate things mathematically, it's very hard to calculate exactly what's going to happen with different parts in the room. You don't see it as often, but you do, you do see it. Um, one of the uh, examples I've been giving recently is I did a, a room out just outside of Dublin and they had a bay window, which is very common in England and Ireland in particular, and that actual whole environment created a problem at 55 hertz, and to deal with that we had to use tunes traps in the area exactly where it was to stop it. So basically, room modes cause nulls and peaks. A null is when you don't hear enough of a frequency, and a peak is when you hear too much. And when you basically, as it says up here, when two or more waves meet and are in phase of each other at a specific frequency, you have a peak in response. When they're out of phase, you have a, a, a null. And sometimes we call, we'd call that either constructive or deconstructive interference. So when we're trying to do a room, those, all of those nulls and peaks, we're trying to smooth them out as much as we can. However, you can never get it perfect. If you can get it down to five or six dBs between them, it's, it's really it's almost as good as you can get. Um, but you know what we're trying to do is smooth that as much as possible. So let's just start up first of all then. Before, if you was coming to us and we was talking to you about acoustics, before we'd even say put a panel in the room, the first thing we always say and talk about is room setup. Um, and there's four guides that I give to you here. Like I said before, the guides, if you meet them all, fantastic, and you're going to have a lot easier time, and you've probably already got quite a nice sounding system. If you can't, there is ways around it. It's just things that are ideal. So in this scenario, this, um, this desk is in the wrong place. I wrote this originally, we did the drawings for, just so you're aware, for, for Pro Audio. Um, a Pro Audio, a, a control room, actually, is just a two channel listening room at the end of the day. It's exactly the same. So it doesn't, you know, the, ignore the desk and it, just imagine it is two speakers. So what we're looking for, first of all, first guide, facing the short wall if possible. The reason we actually say this is because when we were talking about modes in the room, the length, the axle mode, the length mode is going to cause you one of the most problems because all the energy is going down that way and, and they're, going to, they're going to follow down that way. Now, what we, when we say face a short wall, what we really, really mean is the back wall, which in acoustics we always consider to be behind us, if we consider we're facing the speakers, so we're behind the, the sofa, you want to get the back wall as far away from you as possible. The further away the back wall, the less issues you're going to get. Because what happens with, with different frequencies and different sound waves, as they go across the wall and hit the boundaries, that's where this interference occurs. It occurs at different octaves. So the further away you can get it, the less of those octaves are going to actually come into play. Um, oops, I think I've gone a, a bit back there. Let me just go back. So the next one, the second uh, guide we, we look for, 
is to do with symmetry. Imagine in this scenario, the door was at the back by the sofa here. When we're looking for symmetry, we mean a couple of things, really. We mean being in the center of the wall that you've set up against, if possible. Going left or to the right can cause you some low-end issues. We're also talking about, ideally, not having anything in the way of those first reflections on either side of those speakers. So we're talking about, if, if, if possible, avoiding having a door, a window, a bookcase, a fireplace. In an absolutely ideal world, actually, each wall would be made of the same material. Very rarely come across it, to be honest. Um, and it doesn't, unless it's really significantly different, doesn't cause you as much problems as, as, as it can be. I've actually got an, uh, an advisor who works for me um, out of Switzerland, and he's been having some problems recently. We narrowed that down to actually the fact that it was a converted garage, and one side was actually um, th about three times thinner than the other side, and it caused a problem. Um, which um, is, is unusual to see. The next guide is, for me, the most important thing you can do with acoustics, and it's called SBIR, Speaker Boundary Interference Response. It's, uh, it's got, a, obviously, a catchy name. What it actually means is, when you get a speaker, any speaker, it doesn't matter where it is, um, manufacturers used to always tell you, put them as far in the room as you can as possible. However, most people have small rooms, they don't have a, a lot of space. If they started bringing it inwards, they'd lose the, you know, the width and the, sound, the soundscape. So, what, you know, as time's gone on, what we've realized is that interference exists. The speaker manufacturers know it exists, we know it exists, it actually does exist, because basically it means if there's anything near your speaker, the sound's going to interact with it. So what we've discovered is, and this does depend on which type of speaker you've got, whether rear ported, sealed, if they're electrostatics, etc. What we discovered is you can mess with that interference and create what could be a negative experience into a positive one. And the best, you know, one thing can be sometimes moving against the wall can actually get rid of a problem. An example of this is a studio I worked on in London. They had similar to these. They had the amphibian um, amps, you know, with the side um, port, base ports. And if they turned them on the outside of the room, I think it caused a problem at about 60 hertz. If they put it on the inside, it caused a problem at 40 hertz. When he moved them right back against the wall, the entire problem disappeared. Um, what, all I can ever recommend is it's well worth your time just spent just moving your speakers a few inches here, a few centimeters there. The difference it actually can make is, is, is so, so phenomenal that you can actually completely eradicate some of the problems in the room. The fourth guide is to do with where you sit. Sometimes I call it the golden rule. The rules, again, are there to be broken. It's based on the actual physics of rooms. And if you was designing a room just ideally for sound, there's actually different things like the set mayor ratio that you can use, for example, and what they do, and what the, it is, it's, the, it's the, the sort of least resistance in the room. Um, and it's the same principle. Basically, you're looking at 38% from the front or the back wall. Again, it's only a starting point. It's, it's worth messing around and, and trying to do it. But what we're really trying to avoid is the center of the room. Center of the room is the place with the most interference. If you've got a square room, you'll never get the center of the room sounding good. Um, other thing to do to consider with, with that type of thing as well is when you look in at listening, people do have different listening spots, and they might have they might sit at the sofa some points and at the front a bit further on. You've got to decide how you're going to treat that. So. Let's, we, so we've got our room set up as best we can. Maybe we've got three of those principles in place. But we, you know, next thing is placing room treatments. Now, the way I um, look at this, and the way I, I generally would um, do it, is this is just my favourite order. Um, it makes more sense to me. But uh, acoustics is a holistic approach. So what it means is that if you treat one problem and you come to us and say, "Oh, I've got a really bad ringing," and you get eradicate that problem, it unmasks another problem. So it's called masking. Uh, it, it's, and basically, it just mean, it is just as simple as that. That you know, you, if you just dealt with the problem that you hear the most, as soon as you've you've done you've dealt with that problem, the next, the second most problem is going to be there. So the first thing to look at is first reflection points. Um, so what we, this is going to correspond to a graph as well. So what we got is that we got the sound from the speakers, a direct sound, and we call that naught milliseconds. What we then get is we get the left speaker, the sound from the left speaker in the left wall, and the sound from the right speaker in the right wall, and from the ceilings, and if you haven't got anything in front of the speakers, for example, also from the floor. The next thing we get is the left speaker right wall, the right speaker left wall, and it creates a mess. The reason it creates a mess, it's the way that our mind works, is, and I'll show you on this graph actually, 
is that anything that drops with 20, 20 dBs within 20 milliseconds, that is what your mind can't comprehend. This is where all your stereo imaging problems can, uh, can originate from, etc. So you can't actually, what it means is the direct sound and the indirect sound is so fast that you're not actually quite sure which sound you're hearing. So what we have is we, have, uh, we do tests, and this is something you can do yourself really easy. I don't think I have time today to go into it, unfortunately. But you can, you can get a microphone, you can do it at home. Um, the free software you come, um, is called Room EQ Wizard. You just go on there, you don't have to even log in, you can just download it for free. And you can get a U-Mic microphone off the internet, and you can plug it straight into your laptop. Really good. You get things like this, energy time curve. Every single line on here is a reflection. That naught milliseconds was a direct sound. Every other, every other line is a reflection that it's recorded in that room. So as you go on, you can imagine it's secondary, and then third, and then fourth reflections. You see these peaks all at the front, all above that 15 milli, um, dB line? All of those are reflections we want to get, up, get rid of. So you treat it, and you see how it drops down. In our particular case here, you notice we still have two peaks. The reason they're there is that in this particular experiment, we didn't put any um, ceiling panels on the wall. On in place, we just put some side panels. So those two peaks is actually the reflections from the ceiling. All you need is something really simple, like a 50 millimeter absorption panel. And if you put it into place in the mirror point, I don't know if you know about the mirror point, but the general idea is, is you get a friend to go along the side of the wall with a mirror, and when you see the left speaker, you put an X on the wall, and then when you see a right speaker, you put an X on the wall. If I did that experiment here, because it's so wide, you wouldn't, you know, I mean, you wouldn't even have reflection problems from, from that one over there, because it would be well outside 20 milliseconds. Um, as you go, you know, but normally they're very close, and so you get something like this. You can even, in, in small rooms, you can often get away with just one panel, to be fair. Um, so you've got the direct sound, and then the indirect sound gets stopped, and that's how you stop your reflections. So this is this is sort of thing. This is a, a, all you need, really, for that type of scenario. Um, the next thing we look at, rear side walls, or just the rest of the reflected space. We, 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 what we're concerned about here is reverb. We all know reverb. We've all got it. We've all had empty rooms, clapped. It's really, really noisy. Reverb happens where any flat parallel surfaces are opposite each other. And it's in the highs and mids. Two ways of doing it. I don't know how I'm doing for time, by the way. Um. <laughs> like okay. okay. I, I should be able to just cover, cover the rest of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, um, so, the, so there's two different ways of doing it. You can absorb it again, so you can just purely absorb the sound, just like we did with the first reflection point, so you can diffuse it. difference with it is that when you're diffusing it, you're actually breaking up the sound into a smaller, in, in, with a calculated, um, you're going to need to diffuse with a calculation, so this, it's got a smooth response right across, and you're basically breaking it up so it's not going to, imagine it's, it's been scattered out, so it's not going to come back a, and reverb in the same way. The reason that people use that, or a combination of uh, that and an absorber together, is because if you, if you put too many absorption panels of one style in a room, this, um, and a lot of them are broadband, then what happens is you get what's called a dead room. What actually a dead room really means is the highs and mids have been overkilled. So if you're trying to deal with bass, and then you put lots of broadband bass treatment in there, bass traps will do bass, and they'll do highs and mids. All panels will do highs and mids, pretty much, whichever ones you buy. So if you keep putting in the same type of panel into a room, you'll kill it off. And if you kill it off too much, it really is an uncomfortable experience. In fact, you can get fatigued because you, 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 you're not used to the sensation, not being able to hear any um, ambient noise. So the best way to do it, by the way, well, this is an example of one which is a hybrid um, where it's an absorber and a diffuser at the same time. The best way to do it is, is, is to stagger the panels. I know it's obviously nice to think I'm going to do it symmetrical, but it's better to stagger it because you only need to kill the um, reflections on one side. Obviously, we'd recommend putting them on the ceiling as well, and if you do, you'd, you'd put... Um, you'd put them a sort of halfway in between your sound support and, speaker and um, where you're sat in the speaker, sorry. So the next couple of ones are about bass and low end. For us, um, we would actually work everything out from the, from the bass and work upwards. Highs and mids are really easy to deal with. The bass is a lot harder. Now, there's two ways of dealing with bass. And the first one is to do with the back wall. And this is, people sometimes miss this. The back wall, that length um, axle mode in your room is the most important one you can deal with. This is where a lot of those nulls and peaks are going to come from. On the back wall, ideally, if I was building the studio, I would make the whole wall one base trap, 20 centimeters thick at least. So ideally, you want to put at least a couple of thick, at least 150 millimeter panels in place. In this example here, we've also got some um, 
Diffusion, never think you can just deal with diffusion on the back wall because you've got to get all the frequency ranges. If you just did diffusion, um, if you see a studio with diffusion, they're normally like a one and a half meters deep because that's how big diffusers have to be to go down low. Um, so you, you can do a combination of the both, but it is really essential. In fact, if, that's, if the only panels you bought was a couple of really thick sort of monster style panels and put them there, you'd be surprised at the, the absolute difference you'd hear straight away. The other part that we treat is the corners. And the reason we treat the corners is because low end sound is omnidirectional. And what it does is it follows the room modes. Room modes always end in a corner. And they are the biggest place to end is in a tri corner, but there's also a corner anywhere where a wall meets a floor or a ceiling. Now, if you actually play some music and go and stand in the corner of a room, it'd be louder because the sound pressure is actually up. And with acoustics, when you're trying to deal with anything, you know, it's not just about buying some panels, it's about putting it in the right place and knowing exactly where to put things. We have a, a system called um, tuned, we, uh, we call them the Scopus Tune Trap, and what they are is a membrane pressure trap. And what we do with those is we change the center frequency of a different densities material, basically, to, to with, with air pressure, um, by basically, so they absorb in a narrow band way. And that works entirely on air pressure. If you was to go and buy a load of those and put them just randomly in your room, they just wouldn't work at all. So, you, you know, so this is why corners are such an ideal place to treat for bass. If it, you need to try and keep that symmetry you know, when you're dealing with it. So like at the front here, they've got tri-traps in both the corners. If you can't do, both, if you can't do tri bass traps in both the corners, then sometimes it's actually better not to do any at all and just try and deal with a different part like the, where the, the walls meet in the ceiling because you can get away behind you. You can get away with a lot more. You know, a lot of people just do one corner because there's a door and the other one. But in front of you, that, that break in symmetry would, could actually cause you more problems than it's going to solve. Just a quick one here of a, of a graph, a waterfall graph. You do so you do some testing. This is one of the best ones. It, it, people know this as RT60 because that's the official test, which is how quickly each frequency drops by 60 hertz. But it's the decay time. All these, these um, frequencies that are ringing out into your room are going to cause you problems. On this one example here, the dB is the loudness. So that's what the, the sound pressure Sound pressure is loudness. Um, along the bottom, we've got hertz. It's just going to 200 hertz for this example. Normally, it would be 0 to 20K. And the 3D is the milliseconds. How long does that each frequency go out into the room? A studio will go anywhere from 140 milliseconds to 240, depending on what people like. Ideally, at home, you can get about 300 milliseconds. It's great. In this example here, they've got 34 and 70. We put some corner traps into the corner, and you see how it starts to pull it back. That is kind of what we're doing. Every single time we're adding and, and doing traps and different types of things into a room is what we're trying to do. We're trying to get that at all the same level right across the board. Um, so I mean, if this was a situation here, you can tell they still would need more traps that was going to be cover, covering the, the 70 part. So just a quick, really quick recap. So we've looked so far at the back wall, and we've discovered that you know, with those length axle modes, we really do need to put on some really thick panels. We've looked at the side walls. In this case, we put some diffusion on to get rid of the reverb. We've covered our, our, our um, entire um, reflection points here on the ceiling. We've even, put a rug, <laughs> we've even put a rug on the floor to try and stop any coming off, that, off there. We've got corner traps in the corners. We haven't discussed this, the front wall. The reason I don't discuss it in the same way, if, if you really had no windows in the room like this one, then maybe you'd just treat it exactly the same as the back, because it is a length uh, mo axle mode at the end of the day. But more the reason is, is like quite often, um, people. the other thing that people will use that wall for is to deal with SBIR. You've messed around now. You've, you really have moved those back and forth, back and forth, and you've not been able to uh, deal with your SPR, then sometimes putting a thick trap behind your speaker does work. It might work absolute wonders. It's got to be at least 100 millimeters thick, however. One thing I will say is you need to make sure it is SPR, you know, by asking someone like ourselves and we can work with you. Because if it isn't, you can actually make the sound worse if you put a trap in the wrong place. Just quickly before I finish then, I was mentioning REW, Rumi Key Wizard. It's free software. It is absolutely brilliant. This really means now that everybody can test their room at home. And it's, it's, it's great fun. You can, um, you can send people like us the MNATS, which is a file. It, so you go to roomeqwizard.com, and you obviously you can see here, download. You don't even have to sign in. The, the mic down there, the Mini DSP UMIC 1, is a calibrated USB measurement microphone. Yeah, of course, it's about 120 euros. Um, it's, it's really good for its money. I've bought one recently. I've obviously got a bit of a, a more professional testing kit, but I've tried this out, and really there isn't a massive amount of difference. It's really good enough to do what it needs to do. 
Basically, this is what a measurement mic looks like. You put it into your position, so you put it in your listening position, you put it right where your head would be, right where your ears would be, and you, put, you point it upwards. This is the, the, what the program looks like when it's open. This is actually, I haven't got any examples in here, but this is my favorite graph. It's a spectrogram. It's that waterfall from above, so it gives you pressure points and the nulls. As you go up there, you can see that there, that 30 is that 400 hertz peak. Um, it's a great one. But all you really have to do, and I'm just going to flick through these so we can get onto the next speaker. All you really have to do is you go on there, you, you press on the measurement. It's going to ask you to check levels. Check levels are simple as turning up and down your volume to make sure it's right. You're going to listen at your normal listening um, sound. And then you press, you make sure that the start and end frequency is between 0 and 20, because I have a feeling it's, it's preset when you download it as sort of 250 or 500. And then you just press start measuring. On mine there, you can see I did a start delay of five seconds because I wanted to get out of the way. You start measuring, it takes 10 seconds. Um, ideally, you'd do the left and the monitor the right, well, you know, right speaker and then both of them together. And that's just because the si we can, if we do that and we look at it, we can see the symmetry problems in the room as well. It is really great. Thank you very much for taking your time. I'm going to be, for so the rest of the day and tomorrow, in Hall 3, PO6. If you do want to come along and discuss any of these issues or anything you want to show us, pictures of your room, etc., we're more than happy to discuss in a little bit more detail than we've had, been able to do now. And um, also, feel free just to email us and ask or ring us and ask any questions at any time, because that's what we're there for. Thank you.